Thank y'all. How many of y'all are over 50? I know that's tacky to ask that just right out of the gate. Over 50. Okay, I'm speaking only to over 50s. Under 50s, you can just Instacart or play a game. Over 50s. I just want to promise you, I'm here under the authority of Pastor CJ. I was invited. This is not a hostile takeover. I know some of you are like, a chick is on stage. It's okay. I promise I'm here under the authority of Pastor CJ, so don't get all your knickers in a wad. Everything's going to be fine. We're going straight into the Word of God. Now, I should go ahead and confess to y'all, I'm super conservative theologically, not so much sociologically. I am a single mom, became a mom through the miracle of adoption the year I turned 50. I got a little backwards. We want a baby daddy, so if you know somebody between (laughs) 60 and death who loves Jesus and is employed gainfully, that would be awesome. But um, I also should tell you, even though I'm a super conservative Bible teacher, I do ride a motorcycle. Because there's just something about growing up Baptist that makes you long for a reason to wear leather pants. And so um, I do have a motorcycle. I was on it not too long ago. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, which is why I talk funny. And um, I, I just needed a break. I know there's nobody like that at Northview, but I teach at a lot of women's events around the world. And sometimes I come across grumpy Christians. And I'd been with some grumpy Christians and I thought, I just, I just need a break. I'm just going to get on my bike, and I'm just going to go for a ride with no destination in mind, just to relax. So I got on my bike, and I went to this place in Nashville called the Natchez Trace Parkway, which is 444 miles long. That's You have to drive really slow, so there's hardly any car traffic on it. It's mostly bikers and motorcyclists. And I was listening to worship music, and I was just riding my bike, and the sun was starting to set, and there's deer everywhere out there. And I thought, wow, this is just gorgeous. Anybody who questions about having a divine creator, there's no stinking way this could come from pond scum. You know, this is just amazing. So I pulled my bike over because I'd come up next to this hill that was just covered with deer, probably 200 deer. The sun was setting behind that hill and it was casting kind of this peachy glow over everything. And I thought, I just have to sit here for a minute and marinate in God's creation. And so I turned my bike off and I was just sitting on the bike watching the sunset behind those deer. And then I heard this noise in the distance. And I thought, that's another Harley Davidson. When I turned 40, I decided I was either going to get a husband or a Harley. And um, (laughs) nobody I liked asked for my hand in marriage. So I got the bike. So anyway, I thought that's another Harley Davidson. They have a real unique engine sound, supposedly for safety. And I thought it's another Harley. Didn't think too much else about it for a couple of seconds. Then I realized that sound is not only getting louder, it's coming at me. And I'm out there in the middle of nowhere, you know, real rural highway. And so I glance over my shoulder and sure enough, here comes this guy, just big old head to toe leather, tats with what wasn't covered by leather, lots of piercings on a Harley, aiming his bike toward me. And I thought, oh, I might be a little vulnerable out here. The sun is setting. My cell phone doesn't work out here. Not enough G's. Pastor Aaron, I thought, I I could be in trouble. And he just looked pretty fierce. And I thought, oh, shoot, I'm going to be another episode of CSI. (laughs) And he pulls up next to my bike. And and I just, there's nothing I could do. He was so close to my bike, I should have, could have touched him. And then he puts his big boot, boom, boom. Either side of his bike, he pulls his helmet off, and I was like, <laughs> and he goes, are you okay? And I said, yes, sir, I'm okay. He says, is your bike okay? I said, yes, sir, it's fine. I just turned it off so it wouldn't scare the deer. And he said, all right, you need anything? I was like, no, sir, I'm, I'm good. He goes, all right, just want to make sure you were okay. Whoa! And I thought, that's just so not how I thought that was going to go. Just so not, so much better than I thought it was going to go. That, I hope, is what you think when you leave here in about 30 minutes. I was a little scarred when I saw the chick, but that was so not how I thought it was going to go. Bigger still, y'all, that's the Word of God. One of my favorite theologians who's living, I have crushes on all the dead guys, but Dr. Craig Keener 
He's still alive. He teaches at Asbury Seminary in the doctoral program. And he says this, if you get out of the Bible what you're expecting to get out of the Bible, you need to change your expectations. It's always bigger. It's always better. I listened to pastor series on Ephesians and I wanted to be respectful in this family of faith. And I wanted to do a message this morning that was uh, kind of Ephesians adjacent So it'd be in the slipstream of what Holy Spirit has been doing, what he's been stirring in this house. And the Lord led me to a passage in Luke that I think is Ephesians adjacent, uh, the, the macro, the umbrella over this part of the gospel of Luke is very similar to what Pastor CJ has been teaching about Ephesians. As a matter of fact, Luke and Paul were contemporaries. They ministered together. Luke was never in Ephesus with Paul. That's not recorded. But he did go on mission journeys with Paul. Luke is actually the one who wrote Paul's biography, the book of Acts. And so this story we're going to dive into today, I think will bring some color to what God's been doing in this family through y'all study on Ephesians. If you brought your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 11. You're probably familiar with this passage already because the beginning of this passage is where Jesus gives his disciples a tutorial on prayer. He teaches them how to pray, which for them was shocking, not at all what they expected because he begins the prayer, most of us know it, with the word Father. And that sounds innocuous to us, but you've got to remember he's speaking in Aramaic. It's recorded in English, but the word he uses with his disciples is when you approach the creator of the universe, you don't have to approach him all formally. Prior to Jesus' prayer in Luke 11, they'd been taught you actually can't approach Yahweh directly or you'll get fried into a grease spot of oblivion. There's this huge formality about approaching God the Father. Y'all, there's a huge difference between holiness and formality between gratitude and rigidity. Jesus said, you get to approach the king of all kings like this, Abba. It's translated father in our English Bibles, Abba, daddy. If you ever get the chance to go to Israel, you'll see all these little pumpkins run into their dads going, Abba, Abba, Abba. And you realize that that's not formality, that's family. Jesus said, you get to approach Yahweh, the creator of the universe, the only true God, you get to approach him in the security of a child relationship. You get to call him dad. So just imagine their hard drives are already blown. The disciples are already like, what? And then he says, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story to explain the template I just gave you for prayer. And here's the story, verse five. And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking to the 12. And he said to them, which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, those of you who have brick and mortar Bibles, how many of y'all, I'm just asking all kinds of inappropriate questions this morning, how many of y'all are under 40? All right, I've noticed under 40s, I love that y'all have the Bible on your iPhones and your iPads. You're just killing me, son, with a real brick and mortar Bible. You, you, I will get your face tatted on my calf after church today. Because <laughs> so many uh, young believers in our culture don't have brick and mortar Bibles. Now hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Uh, to have a Bible that's bound in leather or imitation leather does not make it holier. Just makes it more tactile. It's awesome to have the Bible on your iPhone and your iPod. That is the word of God, inerrant for God's intended purposes. But I'm telling you, as an old sister in the family of faith, there will be seasons in your life that are difficult. Jesus didn't punk us. He said that in John chapter 14. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. During those difficult seasons, I'm telling you, you won't be very encouraged if you go to bed with an iPad. 
But when you go to bed with a brick and mortar Bible that you have journaled in, that you've written in, that you have prayers and you have dates next to the prayers where God just answered even better than what you were praying, that just reminds us of the goodness of God. He is always good, even when life is anything but. So those of you beautiful under 40s, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to church this morning. We know y'all had other things you could do at the very least sleep late or or binge on Netflix. So the fact that you're in the house of God, you are wind in our sails, those of us who are old and had nothing better to do. Um, So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you don't have a brick and mortar Bible, um, see somebody afterwards. We'd love you out of a a Bible that you can, again, it doesn't make it holier, doesn't make it better. Just makes it practical. So grateful for the word of God. Now, where was I? Because of his impudence, circle that. If you've got a brick and mortar Bible, we'll come back for that in just a minute. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, and y'all know this part, some of y'all have cross-stitched this part. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? At at face value, black, white, and red, this is a really good story. But remember what Dr. Keener said. It's always bigger. It's always better. To really get what Jesus is saying to his disciples here in the context of teaching them that they can have an intimate relationship with our creator, redeemer. He uses, he uses a story that will miss some of the mercy in the story because we don't live in the first century in Semitic culture. He says, okay, suppose you've got uh, two guys and one is a father and he's already got his kids in bed. We usually think of that in 21st century first world terms. So we think, Our kids are in a back bedroom on their phones, perhaps on Amazon Prime, (laughs) if they figured out the password. And if we need to connect with our kids, we text them or maybe use an intercom. That's not the context of the story Jesus is telling. First century Semitic culture, people had small homes And they usually only had one sleeping space. Even today, if you go to Israel, they build up. Not many ranchers in Israel. They just stay together and build straight up. So kids slept with their mother and their father. They had a family bed, usually a pallet. So I want you to get that picture in your head. It's not a daddy with kids scattered in different bedrooms. It's a daddy, and he's right there in the same room with his children. He's finally gotten them to bed. He's read a bunch of stories. They've gotten up for water 17 times. And they're finally settled in bed. And his neighbor, remember homes were very close in villages back then. His neighbor comes over and starts banging on his door because the neighbor has a guest who didn't text first probably an old fraternity brother from Purdue. And he comes over and the guy's like, dude, you're kidding me. If I'd known you were coming, I would have gotten something to eat. You know, I would have at least run us to Taco Bell. I've got nothing to set before you. Hospitality is one of the highest values in their culture. You weren't caught flat-footed without something in your pantry in case you had guests. Women got together every single week to bake bread in this culture. And don't you love that, girls? Keto is from the devil. (laughs) Jesus calls himself the bread of life for a reason. Aren't you glad he doesn't call himself the kale of life? They baked bread in community once a week, and you would make enough bread for your home and another family. That was just common culture first century. So for this guy who had his kids in bed, for his neighbor to not have anything to set before a guest, that's unthinkable. And it panics the guy, and there's no Bucky's in their neighborhood, no 24-hour zippy mark. So he runs over to the dad's house whose kids are in bed and starts banging on the door, tries to make his crisis his crisis. 
And the, the, the dad with the sleeping kids, he's healthy. He's been to all kinds of Christian counseling. And he says, no, brother, Yehu, you should have been prepared. And as Jesus is telling the story to his disciples, I'm using just a tiny bit of liberty with the Greek. As Jesus is telling the story, he says, he won't get up because he's his neighbor, but because of his impudence. This word is a hapax legomenon. For those of y'all who need to impress naughty people in your small group, hapax legomenon, fancy seminary word that simply means it's only used one time in a corpus of literature. So you won't find that particular word anywhere else in the Bible. Jesus only uses it one time. It's only used in Luke 11. A word is used nowhere else in Scripture. The, the Greek, we translated impudence, but that Greek word is anadia. And the only other writer who uses that very often is a historian from this same first century uh, era named Josephus. I know Pastor CJ's talked about Josephus, great historian. Josephus uses the word anadia to describe Nero. Y'all remember Emperor Nero? Remember Nero hated Christians so, so viciously that he would send out his soldiers, this is mid first century, to round up Christ's followers and he would have them impaled on stakes, coated with tar, and lit on fire. That's why you see the pastor of Hebrews saying, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. Because those early Christians were going, this is, this is way harder than we thought it would be. So because of how violent, how cruel Nero was toward Christ followers, Josephus called him impudent. It was a pejorative term. Never used in Scripture, in scripture except this one time where Jesus is talking about us having a real intimate relationship, we can actually commune with Father God. We don't have to go before him with all this formality. We don't have to use a priest as our liaison. We can ourselves go before the creator of the universe. It's it's a stunning concept. He says, the guy won't open the door because the dude asking for help is his neighbor, but because he keeps banging, he'll open the door. And then we get the application. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will be found. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Most of us know that. If you've grown up in church, you absolutely know that. You've probably taught it to your kids. If you're a priester and you only come to church every Christmas and every Easter, I'm not sure why you're here today, but you've probably heard it still. Because it's very common uh, phraseology from the New Testament. And so usually we think the application is bang louder, right? Bang harder. Doesn't that seem like that's the application of that story? That Jesus is saying, if you'll just bang really, really loud, you'll get God's attention. Y'all, when he says, worship me with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, we've got to bring our minds to the table too. We've got a culture that is running away from God. And sometimes it's because Christ followers, we cut and paste scriptures on Instagram, but we don't spend enough time marinating in this miraculous text to be stunned by it. And so consequently, because of our biblical illiteracy, our testimonies have lost their power. Spend time in God's word. I know I'm being bossy and I've not earned the right to say this. I live in Nashville. I'm a guest in this house, so I'm pushing boundaries I implore you, don't let CJ's study of the scripture be the only time you're in the scripture. Don't let his position as your pastor be the only way you're consuming the word of God. Be a Berean, spend time in God's word. I promise it's not boring. It's only boring if you don't dive into it. It's not a textbook, it's not a rule book. It's not a collection of benign morality tales. This is a million times better than Yellowstone. It is so engaging. You got to remember the context. This man is with his kids in bed. Is Jesus saying you have to bang louder? No. Pay attention to parabolic symbolism. When Jesus tells a story, who is the daddy in the story? Every single time, bar none. He tells between 39 and 40 parables. There's some theological uh, disagreement over whether one story is a parable, but he tells, let's just say 39 parables. Every single time 
He talks about a dad in one of his stories, one of his sermon illustrations. Who does the dad represent? I'm not a pastor, y'all can talk back. Who does he represent? God, always, every single time. In every single story, Jesus tells, who do the children represent? Us, every single time. He knows we're sheep. He, he didn't call us dolphins for a reason. We're not that smart. <laughs> so he makes it real clear. One of my favorite commentators on the parables, Dr. Craig Blomberg, considered one of the world's foremost commentators on the parables, he says that the neighbor, because he's outside the family, likely represents an unbeliever. Nobody knows that for sure, but I think that's a great uh, exegetical hypothesis. What we do know for sure is the daddy represents God and the kids represent us. Where are the kids? With dad. With dad. So is he saying bang louder? No. He's saying he's right there. I got to take my little girl, Melissa Price Harper. She's infinitely better as a daughter than I am as a mother. I still can't believe God wove me into her story after her first mama died in Haiti, just absolutely undone. Some of y'all are, are in seasons where you have not gotten what you hoped you would get out of life. Can I continue to be bossy and just tell you stay the course? He's a good God. He's a good God. He's a good God. He has redeemed my story infinitely beyond my hopes and my prayers. He has given me what I didn't have to faith to pray for. I was, I was just thick as a brick when I was a young woman, and I don't mean in the cool Commodores kind of way for those of you who are my age. I was really, really broken. I had a lot of abuse in my backstory. Consequently, I was drawn to abusers. So God protected me from the men I was drawn to and the few good guys I dated, y'all married them. Um, <laughs> because God protected them from me because I was hot mess on a stick. And so the fact that he allowed me to become a parent at 50 of a little girl that all the doctors said she wouldn't live more than two months when I started the adoption process. She's 15. She's here with Kristen and CJ's kids. Healthy as a horse. Absolutely beautiful. He is a redeemer. He's a redeemer. He's a redeemer. He's a redeemer. And we have got to look at scripture under that meta narrative that our God is always good, even when we can't see around the corner of our circumstances, and that our God redeems. He is always in the process of redeeming our inherent dignity as his image bears, as Imago Dei. So he's not saying bang louder. Missy and I got to go to Montana. Uh, friends of ours have a church up there, Levi and Jenny Lesko. We got to go to Montana. It took just forever to get to Montana. We were delayed in O'Hare forever. We finally get to Montana after traveling for like 10 hours. And we get to this beautiful little town, Kalispell, Montana, they live in. And I said, baby, I know it's been a long day of travel. I noticed that there's, there's some really beautiful hiking trails out here. And we've got a couple of hours of daylight left. You want to go for a walk? Missy said, no, ma'am. And I was like, okay, well, I saw there's some canoes down by the lake and a couple of kayaks. Do you want to go out on the water? No, ma'am. I was like, okay. I said, well, well, baby, when we came through that little town, there's an ice cream store. It looked like it had a bunch of candy and, and maybe some games. Do you, do you want to go to that candy shop? No, ma'am. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. So I pulled out my piece de resistance. My piece de resistance is to offer to swim with my daughter in the hotel pool. I hate hotel pools. I think they are just big collections of bacteria and other people's children's leakage. And I just am not a big fan of hotel pools, but my baby loves to swim. And so I said, honey, do you want to go to the hotel pool? It's indoor at this hotel, because of course we were in Montana, it's cold half the year there. And I said, it's heated and it's got a slide. And Missy said, no, ma'am. 
And I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I'm kind of slow on picking things up, but I realized in that moment, I think I'm bugging her. You know, she's a teenager. I thought, I think, I think she's bugged with me. And I said, baby, am I bugging you? And she said, yes, ma'am. And then she said, mama, is that disrespectful? And I said, no, baby, that's not disrespectful. It's called puberty. And I said, honey, here's the deal. I'm going to get on your nerves a lot more and a lot more often over the next few years. And it is totally okay. It's really normal for you to tell me that. And be as respectful as you can when you tell me that. But when I'm bugging you, just let me know and I'll give you some space. And I said, what we can do right now, we don't have to do anything together. I'll draw an imaginary line down this this hotel room and you can stay on on your side and you've got a little bit of homework. So why don't you finish your homework? Then after that, you can chill on your iPad or listen to music and I'll be on this side. I'm finishing up a doctorate in seminary. So I've always got homework. And I said, I'll do my homework on my side. And if you need me, just call me. I'm right here but I won't bug you for the next couple of hours. And she said, thank you, mom. I said, you're welcome, baby. A couple hours went by. She did her homework. I did my homework. And then the sun started started to set. And so I said, we need to go ahead and brush our teeth and get ready for bed. They had two sinks in this hotel room. We brushed our teeth independently. They had two beds. Missy got in her bed. I got in my bed. Missy had been in her bed for maybe 45 seconds before she said, hey, mama, will you come over? scratch my back because I don't think I'm going to be able to fall asleep if you don't scratch my back. And my response was, absolutely not. You better climb out that window and you better shimmy down that gutter and you better walk through the snow to the front of this hotel. And then you come up to the concierge and you ask the concierge if he'll bring you to our floor. And then when you come to this door, you better bang. Baby, you better bang hard. And then I might, I might open the door if you bang. Do you think that's how I responded to my child? This child I prayed for, I don't deserve her. Missy said, mama, will you come over here? Y'all, I didn't touch the floor, I jumped from my bed to her bed and I brought snacks because I love my kid more than I knew I even had a capacity to love. I remember when they first put her in my arms right after mama died, she was two years old. I stepped off this old diesel bus in Haiti. They put this kid in my arms. She didn't like me at all at first. I was just this big pale stranger. I looked down at that child and I thought, I'm done, I'm done. My heart crawled out of my chest and wrapped itself around my daughter. I love her more than I knew I could love. What does Jesus say? How much more? If a parent here wouldn't give a child a scorpion if they asked for a fish, they wouldn't give them a snake if they asked for an egg. Because most of us love our kids even when they're wearing a slap out. We love our kids. You will never know how much you mean to your mama. Even when you're naughty, your daddy thinks you hung the moon. Best thing since sliced bread. Jesus says, how much more does the heavenly father love you? Remember the top of the chapter you get to move toward the king of the world and call him dad. He's talking about relationship. He's not talking about religion. That's what Pastor CJ's been talking about for the last several weeks. When y'all have unpacked Ephesians, he said Christiformity, fancy word that means to be shaped like Jesus. Christiformity is not based on our performance, y'all. Living a holy life, that's our P.S., That's thank you for saving a wretch like me. That's not how we earn his affection. We've already got his affection. If you put your hope in Jesus Christ, you're already right next to your daddy. You don't have to bang. You can whisper and he hears you. 
Christiformity, living like Paul was encouraging those saints in Ephesus to live. It's not based on our performance. It's based on our proximity. How close are you to Jesus? Is there distance between you and the God who loves us more than we can ask or imagine? Are you walking a Luke 11 kind of life? Do you recognize the nearness of Jesus? He's perfectly God, transcendent, fancy word, hypostatic union, very beginning of our belief system. They established a theological precedent called the hypostatic union. That means Jesus is perfectly God and perfectly incarnate simultaneously. That means we've got a God over us that is more transcendent than we can wrap our finite minds around. And that God, because of his great mercy, condescends to be close to us, to be accessible to us. It's a miracle beyond what we can wrap our human minds around. And we tend to labor like we're under the authority of a unibrowed librarian who's just waiting to smack us over the head with the Bible if we step at a line. That's not who he is. That's not who he is. He is holy. Please hear me in my informality say he is a holy God, the only one worthy of our worship. And he's an accessible God. He says, I'm right here. I'm right here. How close are you this morning to our creator, redeemer, 